slightly strange to hear your career talked about like that. Uh, how's everybody doing today? Yeah, we're going to do better than that by the time this is over. Because uh, look, I'm going to tell you what, this is one of those things whenever they, they like send you the email and they're like, hey, you want to go open up for Pause Fest? I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. Not thinking about what's it going to be like to basically be rolling off a 22-hour flight and standing on stage in front of hundreds of people. So a little bit about me. So a lot of people talk about how they were born to be a designer, born to be a creative. That's great. So in my case, it is literally the truth. This is me at two years old standing on the, ca on the feed tray of the 700-pound cast iron letterpress that sat in my parents' basement. My father was a creative director. And so what we would do is we used to go down there and we would write my own storybooks. And then I would actually hand letter set the books and print them myself. It was a spectacular upbringing and basically meant I was a hipster by the time I was in kindergarten because I had been self-publishing for years and was incredibly confused why other kids bought their books. So from there, went on to work in advertising, worked at McCann Erickson in New York, worked there in Dallas. Confused all of my friends 15 years ago by working to work at in-house design, which was this strange thing a lot of people hadn't heard about. Over the next nine years, built the global brand design and innovation team at Starred Hotels, where we worked on doing innovative things like mobile check-in, being able to use your phone to actually check into your room. A lot of this sort of stuff, right, that was true innovation that actually launched in a disruptive way. And along the way, we got to work with some pretty cool people. Like, my work has been in, I think at this point, 10 Apple keynotes, four TV commercials. You can still see it in the human interface guidelines. And anytime Tim Cook talks about what you do, it's kind of cool. So, two years ago, I thought, you know what? The world needs another podcast, which nobody ever believes. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to start a platform to have a discussion that we're going to have today. There are a lot of issues. There's a lot of things that are facing our industry that are real problems. And I wanted to start a platform to be able to start to talk about that. So over the last two years, have built that. We'll get into more of that later. But so about nine months ago, I joined Envision. Before that, I spent three years as the global head of design at Citibank, and then decided that, you know what, there is a real problem in this industry. And I know whenever you see the head, like the, you know, the head of design transformation, it sounds like something out of like HBO's Silicon Valley. Like it's one of those things, like it takes a month to decide, and what the hell does it actually mean? But so what we do is that I really believe that this is an incredibly important moment for all of us. And so that what my team does is that we work with 97% of the world's Fortune 100 brands. And we work with them through coaching, through education, and through thought leadership to elevate the impact of design. I did not say the design team, to elevate creativity and design inside of these companies. Because I hate to break it to you, and hopefully you all feel a little bit better, every company is dysfunctional. It's just how functional are they with that dysfunction. So what we do is to go in and actually help them figure out how do you actually get better at designing creativity. Now, today we're going to talk about crazy. Why is this a word that I use. Why is this, again, my podcast is called The Crazy One and all these other things. Why this word? And I've spent a lot of the past few years trying to defang and, and frame this in a different way. Because look, for me, I truly believe that we're in a moment right now where as creative people, we have the ability to influence business in ways that we have not seen since the Industrial Revolution. I can also tell you that if you're going to stick somebody on a flight for 22 hours and stick them in this spot to come and do a talk, you better have something like that to be able to talk about. But this is my thing, right? This is an incredible moment. We see people that are heads of design. We see a resurgence in design thinking. We see a whole new value for this. But my fear is, and what we're going to talk about today, is that this is just going to be a moment for us. Unless we start to talk about and look at some real changes that we need to do. Because this is the thing that I see as I work with people, as I talk with all these different companies. We're struggling to figure out how to take advantage of it. Now again, a lot of the times people stand on these stages and make big statements like that. Sounds really interesting. Sounds like, you know, again, some of you doing a talk. For us, we've taken that a little bit further. So last week in Envision, we launched what really is truly the world's largest look at the current state of design maturity in the world. I know there are other consultancies, other companies that have done things like this. Our data set is 77 times bigger than anything that has ever been done before. What we did was we actually went out and talked with about, you know, in this case, 2,200 different companies spanning 23 different industries in 77 different countries. It is a holistic and global look at what is actually going on. If this is something that you are interested in while I am here, hit me up on Twitter. It's just at SD Gates. We will find a spot to sit down and I will walk you through this in detail. You can also go to envisionapp.com and download the 80 page report. 
But the reason why I fear that we are having a moment is that whenever we did this, we can see that three quarters of global companies say that they see the benefits of designing creativity. They understand the importance of it. They understand why this is something that they need more of. But the problem is, is that whenever you look at this model, only 5% are truly seeing mature design teams. They're only truly seeing mature creative processes in their company. Our model had these five different tiers. One being the, basically the still like, let's make it pretty design team that whenever you're a part of, sort of saps your soul and kills you a little bit. Number, the level five being the highest design maturity. This is a critical asset to the business. And this is the way the data, whenever we look at it, actually breaks down. Is that what you see whenever you look at this, 83% of world, the world's global companies are in the middle to bottom half of the design maturity model that we put together. 83%. So we see that there's a lot of benefit. We see how powerful this can be. We're having trouble realizing it. So that's what I wanted to talk about today, was the how do we start to change these numbers and how do we start to be able to move these teams up the scale, right? What do we all need to do to start making a difference? Now, one of the things that I'm always a big fan of whenever I work with my teams is sort of like a start, stop, continue feedback model. What do we need to stop doing? What do we need to start doing? And then what do we need to keep doing? Except in this case, I wanted to break it down a little bit differently. I want to talk about some of the places where I think we need to find a little bit of balance. I'm not the person that's going to say design is going to save the world. I'm going to tell you that it can have a profound impact on it. And then I think there are some things that we need to embrace and have an honest conversation about. And the idea with this is that I'm going to go through a lot of this, and we're going to do it quickly. Because for me, I feel like whenever you occupy this, spa this space in a conference, it's to start a conversation. It's to raise issues that I want to follow up and have us start to talk about through the days that, uh, that start to come up. So let's start with stop. What do we need to stop doing? One of the big things for me has been this campaign to get us all to be much more thoughtful about the words that we use. Words like failure. Everybody, fail fast. See all these posters everywhere. Fail fast, fail, you know. No, right? Like, no. Failure is a finite state. Failure is badly positioned, badly publicized learning. Learning is what it is that we actually want to do. Failure is whenever you hold on to an idea too long, you share it too late, you invest too much in it before you actually start to show it to anybody. But the other thing for me, like I'm also on this war that light bulbs are bullshit. Like this idea that creativity is like, like a light bulb and then it just rains like champagne and puppies and it's easy and all this stuff. We are in creating an entire generation of clients that look at what we do and think, oh, it's that easy. Creativity is a blue-collar profession. It is a lot of work. We need to think about the words that we use. And that's why I'll even laugh. Like, you know, whenever I'll walk in and there was that famous poster from Facebook everybody loves, like, move fast and break things. That was great. Nobody talks about how three weeks later a different poster got put over that, which Mark Zuckerberg has talked about, that said, slow down and fix your shit. So again, we need to stop doing things like this. We need to stop just using and accepting these commonly accepted things that are actually hurting what it is that we do. We need to also understand that creativity and great ideas are incredibly delicate. This starts to get emotional and maybe a little bit too touchy-feely, but social media is screwing up way too many of us. Because what happens is that, like, here's an idea. How about for Halloween next year, we all go as the people we pretend to be on social media? Right, because what we're doing is that we fetishize the beginning and the end. We love the two guys in the garage, and we love the stuff we can post on Dribble and Pinterest. The 90% in the middle, we don't want to talk about. It is an amazingly unfair comparison because you will never measure up to what you think everybody else is doing. I will walk into the best companies in the world, and they'll say, like, Steve, we're having problems. Congratulations, you're doing it right. This is not, like, this is not two plus two equals four. Two plus two for us equals burnt sienna. Right? So again, we need to actually have honest conversations about what is it like to build a company? What is it like to be creative? To talk about the problems, not just the shiny moments and all that other stuff, because that's the thing. Like, I know a lot of really important creative people. They're not all that deep. But yet, whenever they're on Twitter and everything else, we act like it's like Yoda writing fortune cookies, and it's just this thing where I'm like, I don't get it. But this is my thing, right? Whatever your process is, whatever it is, is right. And so to think that what you're doing is wrong, that this is why, for me, crazy is so important. Because if we want to change things, we need to stop doing stuff like this. Now start. What do we want to start doing? One of the biggest things that I see time and time again is that creativity dies before it even starts. 
Because what happens is that somebody, an executive, somebody in product, somebody in technology, somebody in design shows up with the answer. This is what we want to do. And so now what I want to do is we need to go through and now vet why that's the answer. Here's the thing I can tell you. If you want to do anything innovative, two things need to happen. One, you're not going to end, be sure where you end up whenever you start. And two, you damn sure are going to fail along the way. Because if you are not willing to fail, you will never do anything original. I can guarantee you that. But I think the other thing is to start demanding originality. This is the other thing that drives me crazy, like words like like. Like, oh yeah, I like it. This is my life's work. I'm not here to like anything. Or it's like, oh, this is like what somebody else did. Congratulations. If you want to be lost and be, you know, not be really be able to stand out, keep doing stuff that people like. Because the three things that I can tell you, if you want to change a company, you want to change your team, you want to change yourself, three things go into it. The tools you use, I kind of have an opinion there, the space that you occupy, and the norms you establish. The norms being what is good enough for you and your team. What are you going to say that this is what we demand of ourselves? Because I had a conversation with a company the other day. They said, tell us what our superpower is. I said, you want me to answer that? They said, no, no, please, tell me what our superpower is. I said, you know what your superpower is? Your superpower is your ability to rationalize mediocrity. Got real quiet in the room after that, let me tell you. <laughs> right? Have that conversation. Like, take on those pink elephants. Do that sort of stuff. But that's the thing, is a lot of this is about balance. A lot of this is about how do we start to look at a lot of really important things. Like, the, there's an incredible struggle right now between data and creativity. Because what do we look at whenever we get this? Data gives us certainty. We love the numbers. We love what that means for us. Creativity gives us possibility. The two have to be in balance, and I hate to break it to you, the two need each other. But what happens so often is if you have just all data, you go data blind. Let's just co-create, and let's just do what consumers tell us. Let's just actually follow the numbers and do whatever that is. Let's have this myopic short-term view of innovating only as far as the project in front of us, and then let's all sit around and have conversations about why we don't understand why we aren't creating more market separation. But on the other hand, if it's all just creativity, right? You are talking to yourself. The days of as designers and creative people where we can be like off in the corner doing a watercolor of our spirit animal while wearing a beret and telling everybody that you don't understand what we do are gone. And this is about being inclusive in what it is that we do. Again, it's about the balance of that. It's about businesses understanding that you also have to balance three critical elements. This chart has been around for about 50 years. It is amazing to me how many people still have never seen it. Any great idea, any innovation sits at the intersection of three things. Something that is viable from a business perspective, meaning that it makes us money. Something that is desirable from a consumer perspective means that it solves an unmet need. And something that is technically feasible, meaning that we can actually launch it. I am sick and tired of watching all these companies that do like press release innovation, where we start up an innovation lab that comes up with a few really nice screenshots that we release to the press to talk about something that we're actually going to do someday, never actually doing it so that the innovation lab can fail a year later because they had no plan on actually how to share anything that they're doing back to the real company. That is, again, that is not what it is that we need to do. These are the major stumbling blocks that we're seeing with so many of these companies. We need balance. And a lot of the other things that we need is we need to, we need to embrace some things. Like one of the big ones for me is embracing imposter syndrome. Stupid people are far too successful. Yes. Stupid people are successful because they don't have fear. Too many creative people are afraid and stop themselves from doing what it is that they really want to do. And so I'm just going to give you like a brief tour of what is design imposter syndrome. There are five types of them. I can guarantee you that you are one of them. If after I walk through these five, you say, I'm not one of these, you are lying to yourself. Because and in many cases, like with me, there's actually a few that I will identify with. There are people who are perfectionists. Perfectionists are those ones that you have to say, like, look, I have to set this crazy high goal for myself. And that anything about that, any self-doubt means that I don't measure up unless I'm perfect. So, like, ask yourself this question. Do you actually have difficulty delegating and then feel frustrated and disappointed with the results that happen constantly? This is a constant leadership problem. One of the things I would do to actually test people whenever they're in leadership, I love how many people just nudge each other and smiled in the audience, where you could actually see, they're like, it's you, you know that, right? But that's the thing, is like that's a huge leadership struggle, is how do I start to trust other people? You have the other one, the superman or the superwoman. 
This is somebody that really, they feel like they're phonies who are somehow working alongside real people who are genuinely talented. And so that because of that, they work harder to measure up. They really get in there to try to almost overdo it. So in this case, like, do you stay later at the office than the rest of your team, even past the point where you've completed your work because you want to show everybody just how hard you really work? Again, I love the, the smiling and nod, nudging each other. The genius. The genius is somebody that they feel like their success is based on their abilities rather than their efforts. And this really means that if they think that they can't, don't get it right the first time, they must be bad at it. So in this case, like, do you actually hate the idea of having a mentor because you think you can handle things on your own? This is that sort of army of one sort of thing. Doesn't work. Creativity is a team sport. Hate to break it to you. The individualist. The individualist is somebody that asks for help, but they feel like if they do that, that by asking for help, that that sort of really exposes them for who they are. So here again, like in many cases, do you frame requests for a project? actually in terms of the project rather than your need. Do you never say, I need, I need help with? It's always, well, this is for the project, this is for the team. It's always for somebody else. And finally, we have the expert. And the expert is somebody that really feels like somehow they've tricked their employer into hiring them. And that they fear kind of like being exposed as inexperienced or unknowledgeable. That, you know, somehow we just sort of got one through. And the funny part with this one is like, these are the people who will constantly seek out training like hoarding knowledge, just trying to hold on to it because they're so afraid of being exposed. Now for me, I identify two, maybe with three of these, but this is a real problem for all of us. And again, I make zero money off of my podcast. I spent an hour in one of my episodes breaking down this entire thing. Design imposter syndrome is rampant and stopping way too many really creative people from getting out there and doing some amazing work. And I think the last part of it for me, and again, why I use the word crazy, you need to embrace who you are. I talk to so many insanely talented people who feel like their backstory, who feel like what it is that they've done is really their weakness. Because your story is unique. Who you are is unique. In creativity and in your creative process, everybody in here has a different way of ideating. Everybody has a different way of doing things. It is not your weakness, it is your strength. And that this is why for me, the quest, the quest around that word crazy is an extremely personal one. Because I spent 38 years of my life trying to be like everybody else and being frustrated by it. I do not understand why everybody keeps trying to be unique, wanting to do this amazing work, trying to do these amazing things by being just like everybody else. History doesn't remember well-behaved people. History doesn't remember the people that do things just like everybody else, right? This is the thought I keep coming back to. A cover band never changed the world. Right? Like, you want to be the Stones? You want to be you too? Great. Be the first one of them. Don't be the second one. But it's a dedication to this, to that sort of crazy to say we need to do something different and to understand that it is not going to be easy. I work with so many leaders that are like, I want to change my company. I want to do something different. I talk to them a week later. They're like, yeah, it's hard. I'm not sure. Great. Get out. Go do something else. Go up in a hamburger stand. Like, go, like go, go do something else. This is not going to be easy, but we're the people that need to sign up to be able to do this. And whenever I say it was personal, it is something that I actually meant. The crazy one for me comes to, I actually have the words on both forums. I can show you under my jacket. Here's to the crazy ones tattooed on my right arm. It is not an Apple fanboy tattoo. It is because I spent 38 years of my life giving way too much of a damn what other people thought. And I wanted a reminder on both of my, both of my forearms to always be who I am. It also does a great job of setting the tone in a meeting whenever you walk in, because they know exactly that you're coming loaded for bear. But this is the thing, right? And look, for me, some days it's an affirmation, some days it's a confirmation. But it needs to be that every single day. Because here's what I want to leave you with. It all sounds great. It all sounds like these are the problems. What do we do? The problem for me is that, you know what, if you want to make real change, you want to do something different, it's not about big set piece moments. It's not about these big talks. It's not about, I'm going to go in and I'm a leader today. It's not. You know what? Creating change is like falling in love. I've been with my wife for 19 years. I can't tell you the moment that we fell in love. I can tell you that it's a lot of little moments that adds up to something really big and really meaningful. You want to create change in yourself, in your team, in your company. It is about going in every single day and doing the work to create that change. Again, going in and just saying now we're all going to be different doesn't work. It has to be sustainable. But I think that's the thing, is it's a lot of these little things that adds up to something big. Because this is the advice I give most of the time to people. Whenever they say, oh, you're so lucky in your career. First off, I say, screw you. Luck has had nothing to do with my career. 
But the thing for me is like, look, success is a choice. And you're going to walk out of here. You're going to meet a lot of people. You're going to take a lot of notes. You're going to have a lot of takeaways what you're going to do. Whenever you get back to work, the choices that you make make the difference on if you're back here next year looking for the same answers or if something is different. Because all of those little things add up to something big. And so that's why for me, I would tell you in this case for this talk, crazy is a choice. Crazy and the ability to say, I'm going to do something different than what everybody else does, that's what really makes the difference. I think at Envision, we are incredibly invested in doing things like this maturity assessment. We're incredibly invested in sites like designbetter.co, a lot of information to try to help with this. We invest really heavily in the community because for us, we know that the tools are great. The tools are really important. But what is holding us back is dealing with all the crap that tends to surround our work. And that's why teams like mine were created. So with that, I want to say thank you. That is my personal email address. If you ever have any questions, if there's anything, whatever you're struggling with that you want help with, do that. Reach out to me on social media. I will get back to you unless I'm stuck on a plane for like 22 hours. But trust me, and this is the way I end every one of my podcasts, my hope for all of you is to go out and to stay crazy. I'm going to go take a nap now because I just burn up pretty much all my energy for the day. You can't do that just yet, Stephen, because we're going to have a little uh, Q&A Ooh, session. Seats. So how okay. about you grab a seat? Take a seat there for okay. me. I'm going to grab this one here. If anyone has any questions for Stephen, I've got a few. Um, <laughs> you can take oh, that. Thank you. There you go. It's all about hospitality here. Yeah, I mean, seriously, if you have any questions, nice. make sure you ask them in Slido. So you download Slido, S-L-I dot D-O. From the App Store, open it up, use Pause19 if it's up there somewhere. No, hashtag Pause2019, and that will get you into our room. And then you choose the global stage if you wanted to ask a question. But in the meantime, first I wanted to make a comment. Sure. Firstly, you say that a cover band can't change your life. And I am going to actually pull you out on that one because <laughs> In 1994, a cover band at Her Majesty's on Queen Street Mall in Brisbane changed my life. So, uh, yeah. Well, but, okay, <laughs> but, but, here, but here's what I would say is, mm. was, it, was it that you were exposed to music that someone else created, or was it the actual cover band itself that changed it? Oh, I think it was probably the bloke I met in the, st on the, in the okay, uh, crowd, well, actually. Well, okay, no, that, that's, okay. <laughs> Um, but no, in all seriousness, I did want to ask you a couple of questions, um, firstly about the design imposters, because I looked at all of those and went, oh my goodness, I'm a bit of that one, I'm a bit of that one, sure. I'm a bit of that one. Where do you see yourself in the imposter group? Oh, um, and how did you discover that? You know, I, I think a lot of it for me was I, definitely in the perfectionist, I think definitely in that sort of, you know, feeling, because I mean, at the end of the day, I feel like even I look at my book and all that stuff, I'm not very creative. I'm a great mimic. I feel like I'm great at being able to sort of be empathetic to things. I never feel like I'm actually genuinely that creative. I think a lot of it for me, honestly, came out of this sort of quest that I've been on over the last like 10 or 15 years to just figure out how to be happy. Mm. Because I, I think, you know, creativity comes with this sort of state of insecurity that am I doing it right? Am I, am I doing? And I always felt like, you know, even like I would. I'd have some great success with Apple or whatever it was, and like that would be great. And then you know a week later, I'm back to like you know grinding and things like that. Um, so a lot of it came for me was starting to realize that happiness was a state that you would achieve and then you'd move on from. So for me, it became much more about joy. And I thought, okay, if I'm going to have joy, I really need to understand this. And so anytime for me, I, I just do a lot of research. Like whenever I used to pitch new business, I would go study with like poker players or interrogators from SEAL Team Six or. Like really, oh yeah, like I'm really creepy to be around sometimes because I can read body language and do all that stuff. We'll talk later. Um, but I'm freaked out. <laughs> but I think, but for me, I'm an it's, imposter, it's, I've been found out. But for me, like the, the approach to trying to figure out these problems has always been, how do I understand the thinking, not the behavior? Because I think too many times as you look at cultural changes, you look at things like that, what people try to deal with is the behavior. Behavior is the expression of a much deeper problem. The thinking is what sits underneath it. And like I said, whenever you can see, do you not trust people? Whenever you see that you stay too late at work, that's the behavior. Mm. It's how do I get to the underpinning and the thinking? That's the actual root of the problem. Because if all I do is triage the behavior, that's great. I can change that. It will re-manifest itself some new way in a couple months. And so I think you know I get very introspective about that sort of stuff and trying to figure out what is actually going on. And I think you know the podcast for me has been amazing because it, it's so wild to share what you're struggling with, and then it's so wild to get that back like 20-fold from people who are going like, I've, I've always felt that same way, I just never wanted to admit it. 
Yeah, I mean, and that's a really interesting theme. Do you think that might be a shift in the way that we are interacting with each other in work and business? My sense has been from being in the tech industry for going on 10 years now is that there was a long period there where it just felt like it was the lone genius. And you couldn't yeah. really sort of, it didn't really feel like that there was a very collaborative um, way of building things together going on. And I feel like there is a bit of a shift there. Well, Are you experiencing no, there, anything well, like that? No, I think that? partially, who wants to work for that person? Right? Like the Steve Jobs of the Elon Musk story is great. Nobody wants to work for them. Mm. Because just the idea of like, you know, you have all the big ideas and we'll execute it. Interesting, but not really sustainable. Um, but I, I think that a lot of it for me has also been the realization that, that just the word design has changed because it's gone from what primarily has been visual design to product design. Mm -hmm. And I think out of that has really come a focus for what used to be design in the traditional sense of the word, which was actually going in and doing visual design, to a much more of a shift around creativity. Mm. Creativity is about problem solving, creativity is around consumer centricity, creativity is about bringing people together, because the thing is, everybody's creative, most people just forgot. Like, I work with Fisher Price, you go in there and you watch those kids, you'll see boys who are superheroes, a plumber, there's a boy wearing bow and heels. Our society, our education system, and our jobs have told us that's not viable for us to be able to do. So I think as you look at creativity, and as you look at the transition into product design, it, we need to be much more inclusive. We need to, we're, we're just, we're asked to be playing a very different role. And I think that where we struggle is a lot of people still view it as visual design. Because for me, you know, what we do is problem solving. Mm. And that's what creativity is. Design is then the visual expression of the solution. And I think in many cases, being clear about the delineation between those two really will start to help you, again, be able to embrace for yourself or for your team how do you start to do that? Because I think that's what's driving that transition where we're seeing we're just being asked to do more. When you were talking about the sort of the trio uh, of right. uh, Venn diagrams before, and you said this is really like an idea of a business that's doing well, have you got any example businesses that you think are striking the right balance between creativity, yeah. individual expression, building products together? Well, and that's why, because I, I think you know, most of the ones that people have fetishized for years, I think, you know, if you look at Tesla or Apple or, you know, Nike, a lot of those sort of ones, I think that they're really good at doing, I think the ones that struggle, one of them is out of balance. Mm. Because of, if I think it is all just business and money led, mm. then you really struggle to connect with your consumers. And I think you see a lot of brands that do really well and then will start to prioritize money, the quality starts to fall off, that starts to go away. You see ones that are very visionary. They, they talk a lot about the things that they want to do. They don't ever really launch, so, so they're not very good on the feasibility part of it. And then I think a big part of it, and it's amazing to me, how many companies I need to work with that say, hey, maybe you should go talk to those people that are actually buying your stuff. That, because you know, you know, a lot of the times, head of design, the role lately has come down to like executive hysteria management. Right, meaning, wow. right, I'm yeah. putting that on my Pat, LinkedIn yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but I think, but a lot of it is like some executive says something because they feel like being in charge is that they have the answers for it. Mm. And so then everyone runs around trying to make that the case, and then whenever it launches, then we say, oh, you know what, this actually wasn't anything a consumer actually wanted. Mm. So again, I think that there is about the balance, because whenever you're able to balance the three, and in many cases, if you look at an organization, it is the balance between a, a, a design team, a tech team, and a product team. Because I think in many cases, design is, is what a consumers actually want, if feasibility is in technology, and profitability tends to generally sit in product. If that is a dominant organization where one leads, then you tend to see it struggle. And in many cases, that's why when people don't bring in design thinking, they would bring in all this other stuff. If there's not balance and there's not trust, it's not a magic bullet. Like, you can keep bringing in stuff to the cows come home. We will keep writing books on self-help and creativity until the cows come home, because so much of it still remains about the interpersonal relationships and do we really trust each other? Hmm, okay, I think that's pretty wise. Uh, I've got one final question for you before we finish up today, Stephen, and you can probably go and have a well earned rest after your 22-hour flight. I did want to ask you specifically about your 22-hour flight. What did you do? Um, well, if, is in, it your first the, one? Is it your first 22-hour flight? Well, so, on, so this is the first of a series of keynotes that I'm doing um, in South By and a bunch of others. So basically, I'm traveling from now until June. Um, so I slept for about 10 hours because I don't ever get a chance to like be in a technology free zone. So that was weird and spectacular, followed by the next six hours of working on three keynote decks for, for talks that I've got coming up, trying to triage Slack and email and stuff like that.
Oh, okay, cool. I usually just watch a TV show. And yeah, no, and I think, well, so in, <laughs> in, in, most people don't know, the, the joy of Envision is also, we're, a, we're the world's largest completely distributed remote company. Uh -huh. We have no office anywhere in the world. Interesting. Um, so again, you very much are empowered and asked to sort of ask to work from anywhere. So um, yeah, for me, the, the moments where I can actually concentrate uninterrupted are rare. So yeah, I actually, and had never flown Qantas before, and it was awesome. So... The flying kangaroo. Hey, yeah, I'm, I'm not judging the branding, and just the plane was great. Well, that's great. Stephen, thank you so much for your time today. You've been a really enlightening and in inspiring first speaker here at Pause this year. So thank you. A big round of applause, please, to Stephen. Thank you.